country. I knew if I worked at this ride, I could get it. I uh, went down to the shindig last night, and a lady, she's down there, 90 some degrees, too hot for anybody in the world to be there. I found me a little soft spot. I had, uh, I had kind of, uh, what should I say, uh, snuck in my little cooler of water and ice. There was a lady that was, they had to walk up there on the top part. I wasn't going to go down to the cement part, and the top part was gravel. This lady, she was, she was up there, maybe a little older than me, and she come over to me to take a break because I was at, there was like a big cement thing here to, to uh, she could lean on. She uh, literally, uh, she she thought it was important to be walking out there and that stuff, and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm down here in the corner of a little seat. Mm -hmm. It was actually shade that morning against the flood wall, but then she took off walking like she's gonna leave, and she started to stumble and fall on the ground, and I thought she was gonna die, or, you know, I'm fall over, and I'm like, scared me deaf, and uh, but I turned around and. Uh, I supplied her with some ice and water to her ice and kind of kept her going. Well, you know, we're here trying to get people to join this fellowship, and, but you know, I was kind of looked at, uh, I was an oasis that late. And I don't know that she would have made it to the end. But you know, the funny thing was, she turned back around after she got so far and come back, and I'm like, and then she went the other direction after she took another break. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know. But uh, I've been doing songs down at the cafe, Diane Porter, which you all know. She supplied me with a guitar down there. So I'd have to pack it and pack her wife been on me a little bit. And uh, I will say that uh, it's been good. I've been good, good fellowship. We did pretty much secular music. But I, I slap in a couple of my Christian tunes too. And, I'm really getting a good response. So, I mean, you know, Jesus said to reach them where they're at, you know, and so, so I'm trying to reach a few of them down there and meet a lot of new people and the whole deal. I'm going to attempt to do a song, which I don't know what the song I have picked out of it does not hit me right now. It's been a while since I did this song, so if I stumble to it, well, praise the Lord.
alcoholic drinker. And I know I must have been every bit of three years old, maybe four, down in Florida. He was babysitting. He drug me in the bar. And I remember seeing the beautiful lights on, a, on the record player, a jukebox. And they were playing that whole world in his hands. That's all. That's all that stuck to me. That's all that stuck to me all these years. And I, I finally incorporated it above my tune, man. I, but the, I thought it was funny, man. I thought, man, it's probably the one thing I remember as a child was him. He drug me in the bar. The other time he drug me in the bar, he said, uh, he set me up on a stool and he knew I'd like the little cherry cop drops. And he sat me on a stool beside me and he said, uh, he looked at me and there was a rope sitting beside him. He said, you see that guy right there? And he'd been talking to him. I said, yeah. He said, that guy there, and they had new cop drops back there, right? The cherry and the black flavor. He said, that guy right there, Doug, is the owner of Luton's Cherry Cop What? <laughs> oh, yeah. He said, this guy there is the maker and founder of Luton's. And of course, the drug side said, yeah, son, would you like for me to buy you a can thing of Cherry Cop Drops? <laughs> Mama, I that was a manipulator. Man. You had drug bought, bought me two packs of Luton's Cop Drops. I don't know why. <laughs>
Thank you, Brother Doug. I actually did that song two weeks ago down there at the cafe, and I can honestly say I messed up on the end of it. But uh, I still got a standing or got an ovation for it, and so I did it again this week. And uh, you know, I, I'm, impact, I'm, I'm impacting people that are not Christians with Christian music. Right. And me and Tony, we've always had a little bit of struggle with each other. I told Tony, I said. There's nothing wrong with coming in there singing a nice, easy song that's not necessarily Christian that they recognize. But you win their trust and confidence, and then they throw a song like this in there, and it'll affect them. You know? So it's a good thing. They burned his heart to for rhythm, and they did no good. I just joined. Just joined together with me for uh, Roy's brother. He had a heart procedure, and it didn't didn't work and he wants us to pray with us to agree on together. But Lord, we lift up Roy's brother right now to you. His yes. life is in your hands. And Lord, uh, yes. you're the one who controls the tempo and the beating of the heart and the one who uh, is able right. to create uh, wholeness and health. We just pray you touch his heart, heal his heart, Lord, of every abnormal rhythm. Uh, and Lord, uh, restore it and renew it. And God, uh, in this moment, let him sense, even where he is, the spirit, presence, and power of the Lord to heal him and make him well. God will give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, brother. Amen. God bless you. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject true freedom and we hear a lot about freedom uh, and we might ask ourselves the question uh, what are we free to do because freedom implies that I can do something right uh, that I have a an ability or a liberty and uh, so freedom is it is it a freedom to sin is it a freedom to love is it free love is some people say, or is it another kind of love, or am I free to serve? Well, Holy Spirit, add your blessing to the reading and the ministry of the Word of God today, and uh, God bring to pass that which pleases and honors you in it. In Jesus we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. The 4th of July is coming up, and it's a celebration of our freedom as a nation, and uh, we all know that day and enjoy it as a holiday. Independence Day, uh, as we call that uh, day, is a day that uh, commemorates the Declaration of Independence that took place on July the 4th. The Continental Congress declared that the 13 American colonies were no longer subject to the monarch of Britain. I think that's a very important statement that this declaration of independence or of freedom meant that I am free from the control of another monarch. But now we are united free and independent states and we know that those states were founded on the basis of Christian principles as a republic and one of the things that the founding fathers said was that this kind of republic will not succeed unless we are a Christian nation. So their idea of independence from Britain meant that there came with that a sense of dependence upon God and that we were dependent upon Him for the realization of our freedoms. Amen. You know historically that after the Declaration of Independence, America fought a war and we had to fight that war so that we could be physically free from the domination, the military power of Britain uh, in that era so that we could be an independent nation. We could be free uh, from their control. Well, the scripture teaches us in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Notice that Christ set us free 
to be people of freedom. That means that we have a power to do certain things, to be certain people. And he tells us that he has set us free, so we need to do what? Just like they had to fight after they declared their independence, there is a spiritual battle and warfare that we're in. And it said the enemy is trying to bring us back into subjection to a yoke of slavery. But notice he says, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, one of the principles of Scripture is that true freedom of the Christian begins when we find Christ in our lives. Christ is the foundation of, He is the source of all freedom. Christ's death, Christ's burial, Christ's resurrection sets us free. Free from what? Free in what sense? Free from the guilt of sin. How many of you are thankful that you have been forgiven of all the sins of your life. Praise Amen. God. We have been forgiven from the guilt of our sins. But we've also been freed from the power of sin. So that sin no longer is able to dominate us and control our lives as it used to do. And we have been set free from the consequences of sin. That means that we will not suffer the wrath of God for the sins that we have committed in the past. We've now been forgiven and the consequences of those sins has been taken away. Somebody say, praise the Lord. I'm not going to die eternally. I'm not going to perish in hell. I'm going to live with God forever because of what Christ has done. He has set me free from the guilt of sin, the power of sin, and the consequences of our sin. And ultimately we know that Christ will set us free from the very presence of sin because there will be a day we will create a new heaven and a new earth in which there is no evil, no sin of any kind in which we will rejoice. So Christ sets us free to begin a new life, one that is dependent on Christ, one that's in submission to Christ, but one that's independent from sin. So we have a new life, first of all, dependent on Christ. You can't live the Christian life without Christ. You can't be a Christian without Christ. A lot of people are trying. They think they've just got to do their best or be a good person. But you can't live the Christian life without the Christ uh, of the Bible living in your heart. You can't be a true Christian and follower of Christ unless you live in submission to Christ, being obedient to Him in your life, to all the things that He says in His Word, and you live your life therefore independently from a sinful lifestyle because you've been set free. Now Paul the Apostle points to the nature of our freedom in Romans chapter 6, and I want to take you there with me if you will. Romans chapter 6, and I want you to read with me. We'll consider this passage at length here. Listen to what he says in verse 1 of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase or abound? Are we to continue in sin? What is Paul's answer? May it never be. So anyone who wants to get you to indulge in any kind of sinful behavior needs to hear what the Apostle Paul says. May it never be. That's his answer. He goes on, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And you're saying, of course, When did I die to sin? When did I die to sin? Listen to what Paul goes on to say. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? So whose death is he speaking about? He's speaking about two deaths. The death of Christ and your death in Christ or with Christ. Therefore, verse 4, we have been buried with Him, with Jesus, through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. In newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be 
in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self, what is your old self? Your old self is the life that you lived in disobedience to God. It is the, the, the life that you lived when you said, I'm going to run my life, not God, not Christ. It's the life you lived before you accepted Jesus. But after you've accepted Christ, now He's Lord operating in your life and you're going to do His will. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin, that old lifestyle and old ways, might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Did you catch that? We would no longer be slaves to sin. Now, there are things in everybody's life that people have been enslaved to. There, if you took it, it's about that long. It's white, maybe tan sometimes. Has a filter on the end sometimes. People are bound to those things. We used to call them coffin nails. Some people are bound to coffin nails. They're slave to it. They just feel like they have to do it. There are others who, who do it differently. They take a needle or a syringe and they poke it up their veins and they're under the domination of that. They're in control. Then there are others, they just take a little pill bottle and they shake it out of their pill bottle and pop that maybe four or five so they <coughs> reach some kind of a haze or, or, or place. Then there are other people who do it with a spoon. They don't need just the calories they need to maintain health. If they go out to eat, they eat until they're so full, would feel like they're in misery for a week after they get home. They overindulge, and overeating is a lifestyle for them. That's just as sinful. Gluttony is just as sinful as shooting up with drugs or any other thing if it's destroying you and taking your life. Amen. Now, a lot of people say, Pastor, you can't say that. Oh, yeah. You make too many fat people unhappy with you. Well, I'm a fat person too. I understand where you're coming from. I like to eat. But let me say to you, if you're living to eat instead of eating to live, are you with me? There's a big difference. And God hates sin of any kind or gluttony. Notice he said, we would no longer be slaves to sin. So it doesn't mean, it means, or what it means is that you're not a slave to the spoon any more than you're a slave to the cigarette or you're a slave to the needle or you're a slave to the pill. Right. Amen. 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 That we're not a slave. No longer a slave. You need to realize and recognize that when you receive Jesus Christ, He set you what? Free. 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 He gave you freedom to be somebody different than you have been in your life. Verse 7 says, For he who has died is freed from sin. I like it. I'm freed from sin. I'm freed from the domination and the control and the power of sin in my life. Because I have the living Christ in me and I've risen with Him in my heart. Now, Paul goes on in this same passage in verse 8. Read with me. He says, Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead is never to die again. Notice, death is no longer master over Him. Did you catch that? Death is no longer master over Him. Well, what do you think happened to you when you came to Christ and you received Him as your Savior and your Lord? You need to recognize that sin no longer has dominion over you. You, you may have been told, well, you just can't stop this. You just have no power. You're just weak-willed. You just have that ability. You've been raised with Christ. Recognize that the living Christ is working in you and through you. There is the power of God surging through your spiritual veins. So that the Word of God is teaching you you've died. You are freed from that sin that controls you. You don't have to do it in your life because Christ is working in you. It is not master over you. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Consider yourself what? Dead to sin. 
So when you look at yourself, you see yourself, I'm dead to that. I don't have to do that any longer. You know, the way some people live and act is that this thing in my life that uh, is a habit or a bondage in my life, I just can't get over it. I can't get past it. Why not? Is, is, is not the power of the living Christ able to take away your sins? Is not the power of the living Christ able to keep you safe from here to eternity? Isn't the power of the living Christ able to raise you from the dead in the last day? Isn't the power of the living Christ able to surround you with the gates of, uh, of protection in your life and to watch over you? Is He able to do that? Yes. Then why is He not able to deliver you from something in your life that is not as significant as those things are? He is able. And you need to recognize in your life and in your mind and your spirit that you you are alive to God and death no longer is master over you. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And every time the old devil comes along and he tells you you can't do it, you just say, I'm dead to sin but I'm alive to God in Jesus Christ. I'm dead to sin but I'm alive to God in Jesus Christ. Every time you do that, the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Almighty God just surges up inside your soul and spirit because of your confession of faith and what Christ has done for you. Hallelujah! Amen. He continues in this chapter, in verse 12. Hallelujah. Therefore, notice these words, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Some of you act as if you have no ability to resist sin. You act as if you have no power to say no to wrong or no to evil or no to something that has been a habit in your life. You act as if the enemy uh, has got such a hold on you and you just can't get away from it. But notice that Paul said when you receive Jesus Christ into your life, something happened in you that changed things. And he said, you do not have to let evil rule or reign in you. Listen to what he says. Therefore, do not let. Does that imply that there's a power in you that enables you to resist evil and that which would try to control you? Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, in this body, so that you obey it in its lusts or its desires. Notice he says again, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So he says you don't have to keep giving yourself to do what is wrong. Notice what he says. Do not let. Do not present. So if, I, if, if every time I, I walk down the street, if I've got a lustful mind and spirit, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm dealing with that in my life, if I look out there and, and I see uh, someone and I, I let my mind wander, I'm letting it happen. Are you with me? Yeah. The scripture says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. I have control over my thoughts. I have control over what's going on in my mind. And he says, don't go on presenting your body. So I don't, if my mind goes a certain way, I don't have to yield my body to that direction. I don't have to present my body to do what is wrong. But listen to what he says. Present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Notice verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you. Did you catch that? Yeah. Sin shall not be master over you for you are not under law but under grace. You are not under law, but under grace. Now our text, our primary verse we began with is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Christ didn't set us free to be captives again of, of sin and evil. He set us free so that we could be free from certain things in our lives. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Did you catch the personal responsibility there? What Paul says? He said, you are responsible not to be subject again to the yoke of slavery. You are responsible 
take charge in your spiritual life. So there are three things I want to point out to you here that are part of our true freedom. We have the freedom to refuse the evil desires of sin. That's what Paul has just said. We have the freedom to refuse. Secondly, we have the freedom to ref refuse our body to be used for something that is sinful. Amen. I don't have to give my body to do something that is wrong. Third thing, I have the freedom to present myself to God as a servant of righteousness. I give myself to the Lord. Now, Romans 6, verse 15. But what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you notice the words, present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. So Paul basically points out that whoever we choose to obey is the one whose slave we are. Whoever we choose to obey is the one whose slave we are. Notice what he goes on to say. But thanks be to God that though you, and notice the tense, it's past tense, were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. So you were slaves to sin, but now having received Christ, what do you do? You become obedient from your heart to the teaching that you've received. You don't just keep doing what you did. Now your life is being changed degree by degree, inch by inch, foot by foot. And you're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And now you become obedient to the heart. Verse 18, and having been freed from sin. How are you freed from its sin? By its control, by its domination, by the necessity to sin. You've been freed from sin. You became slaves of righteousness. Slaves of righteousness. Hallelujah. You're always going to be somebody's slave. You have to choose who you want to be. You have to choose who you want to be. I want to talk to you about something we've been speaking about and reading about, and it's the law of presentation. The law of presentation for service. Paul uses this phrase, Present yourself, present yourself, present yourself repeatedly in Romans chapter 6. I want you to listen. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? So Paul says we all have the privilege of presentation. So what am I talking about presenting? I'm not talking about some object that I'm, I'm presenting. I'm not talking about uh, some thing that I present. I'm talking about presenting myself, right? That's what Paul's talking about. We have the power, the law of presentation. I can present my body to Satan and sin and death or I can present my life and my body to Christ and to righteousness and to life. There is the law of presentation. So if I present myself to anyone to obey them, I become their servant or their slave. I become dominated and ruled by them in my life. But thanks... Be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you are committed and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness, meaning that you became a person who is committed to Christ and His Lordship and His leadership in your life. So true freedom. Christ set us free. So that we, as the people of God, can become slaves of righteousness. Slaves of righteousness. Now when we think of slavery, we think of something 
normally in a negative frame of reference. But Paul's using it here in both a positive and a negative sense. He's using it in the sense, using it in the sense that if I am a slave to sin and to that which is wrong, that results in my eternal death and my loss. But he's using it in the positive sense that if I become the slave of Christ, I'm being set apart to God and I'm being set apart to righteousness and I've been set free from the law of sin and death so that I don't have to die because of what I'm doing and how I'm living. Christ has set me free from that. And true freedom is found only where? Is only found in being Christ's servant, Christ's slave. You're never free until you're serving the Lord, until you're following Christ and you're walking with God. Hallelujah. Listen to what he says in Romans 6 verse 19. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you, and here's the word, presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. So these people in Rome, the, these Christians that he's writing to, in the past had presented their bodies to sexual and moral impurity and to lawlessness, things that were contrary to the law of God. And what did it result in? Resulting in further lawlessness. In other words, they did that which was wrong and that was like a sowing of a seed. And that seed began to produce more of the same. Immorality, uncleanness, impurity, mind, soul, spirit, and body. They were contaminated and they were impure. And they gave themselves to that. So they were a slave to impurity and lawlessness resulting in more lawlessness. He said, now listen. So just as you did that before, just as you yielded yourself to your impurities and your sensuality and to your bondages, he says, now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. Present your body to Christ. Present your mind to Christ. Present your thoughts to the Lord. Your tongue to God. Present all that you have and all that you are to Jesus Christ. And say, Lord, I'm your servant to use all I am and all I have to please and honor you in my life. And he says, when you do that, it results in your sanctification. Now, what is he talking about? Remember, he said before... When you live the life of lawlessness, what did you read? More lawlessness, more impurity, more sin, more, more contamination. But now, when you become a person who serves Christ and you do what is right, what happens? Is you become set apart to God. You become God's holy person. You become a person who is being made like Christ and purified in His image. And you're being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Somebody say, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. So when you present yourself, you know that a process is taking place in you. That God is working in you. You say, Pastor, I fail sometimes. All right. Don't wallow in your failure. If you fail, don't wallow in the mud of your failure. Get up. Say to God, Lord, I failed. I don't want to wallow there. I don't want to stay there. I don't want to be where I've been. Lord, I am resurrected with Christ. I have the power to present myself to you, to live a new life, to walk with God in a new way. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed, free in regard to righteousness. That means that when you were a slave to sin, you couldn't do what was right. When you were living in immorality and lawlessness and disobedience to God, you just you really couldn't do what was right. In fact, you did all the inconvenient things that people can do. You lusted, you sinned, you abused, you were abused, all kinds of things that took place because you were, were sinful and you chose that as your life. You were free, you just couldn't be right. Now, he says, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things that you are now ashamed of? For well, the outcome of those things is death. He says, what was the benefit of living a lawless and immoral life? He said, death, 
spiritual separation from God, eternal death, eternal hell, separated from God. That's the result of those kinds of things in your life. But look what he says in verse 22. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, in other words, you become a committed follower of Christ, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification with the outcome of eternal life. So now because you have been enslaved to God, you also have a benefit. And that benefit is that you are set apart to become a holy, pure person, but also the end result of your loving and serving and knowing Christ is that you have eternal life. For to have Christ is to have life. Hallelujah! Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. So do you, do you catch what Jesus is saying to us? Look at, look at the verse 22 again. But having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is what? Death. 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 But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah! Amen. Amen. Now, Romans 6, 7, and 8 in Paul's writing is one extended long argument. I'm going to jump over part of that and I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 8 to hear Paul's, part of Paul's conclusion. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Remember what Paul talked about in Romans 7? He said, I, I was under the compulsion. I, I knew I ought to do something, but I couldn't do it. I knew it was right, but I didn't have a power to do what was right. And he says, I tried and I failed. And, and, he, and he had this terrible cycle of spiritual failure rather than success in his life. But listen to what Paul says. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law that of sin and death which means that you have to sin and you have to die as a result of your sin or you you are bound to do what is wrong and you can't help yourself Paul says God set me free from that God set you free from that so that you don't have to live in sinfulness for what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh God did sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Now notice this next verse. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. In other words, the law had a righteous standard, a requirement in conduct and character, and in, in spirit. And, and so people broke that and disobeyed. And Paul said, even though I knew it was right, I disobeyed it and did what was wrong. But listen to what he's saying. He says that that righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us. In other words, we can live right. We can obey the law of God. We can do what pleases the Lord. How? In us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, right, righteous people who've received Jesus Christ into their life have presented their bodies to Jesus as a living sacrifice. Are you with me? Amen. They are able to live righteous lives because they are led by the power of the Holy Spirit. The true freedom of the Christian comes because of the reality of the Holy Spirit who lives within our hearts and lives. When you were born again, you were born again of the Holy Spirit. You were born into the family of God. And you received the Holy Spirit as the earnest of your inheritance in the kingdom of God. You say, how do I know that? Because the Word of God makes it very clear. He says, flee immorality and every other sin. Uh, man commits is outside the body but the immoral man sins against his own body or do you not know that your body is a what temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you hallelujah who is in you so the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus 
comes to live and dwell in you. He comes to inhabit you as a vessel of Christ. It is the power of the Holy Spirit in you who enables you to live differently. He says the Holy Spirit is in you because you have you are not your own anymore. Now you are God's. So since you are God's and you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can be different. You can live a different life. You have the presence of the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And the Bible says you have risen with Christ. Not simply in principle, but by the power of the Spirit of God in you, you have risen from the power of, of sin's control, risen and died to the evil of the past to live a new and a different life in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Read it with me again. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the living God. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Notice the first word, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. In other words, a person who wants to do what they want to do and don't care if God likes it or not, they're at odds with God. They're hostile to the Lord, so they don't listen to what He says. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, what, what do you think about that? Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, he's not talking about just this physical flesh. He's talking about that flesh where we do what we want and live according to what we want rather than according to what God wants. We choose to be disobedient to the Lord. How do I know this? Listen to what he says. However, you are not in the, the flesh. What did he say about you? What did he say about you? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of the Lord, what did he say about you? You're not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. Somebody say, thank God. Thank God. If you've received Jesus Christ, he says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. For if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, do you get the point? If the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, and he just said, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit. He says, if he dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now this has both a present and a future fulfillment. There will be a day when the Spirit of Christ will raise us from the dead and resurrect us from our, our uh, physical death that we have experienced. But I want you to know that here and now, the Holy Spirit lives in you to quicken, to give spiritual life and power to you and your physical bodies so that you may stand up in the power of Christ and deal with the issues and the powers of this world and the sin that would try to dominate you in your life. And you can please God. Hallelujah. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So, what, what, what about it? What does Paul mean? What's the obligation? Listen to what he says. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Do you get that? You're under no obligation to, to be disobedient. You're under no obligation to be bad, mean, ugly, <coughs> stupid, foolish, wicked, vile, angry, mean-spirited. You're under no, uh, no compulsion to do that. You don't have to live that way. You can be a different kind of person. He says, you are not under obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Did you catch what Paul's talking about here? 
Now we're all in spiritual warfare every day. We fight the devil on the left hand and on the right hand in the way we think and the way we live and the way we act every day. Every one of us are there. And, but I want you to hear what, what the Apostle Paul is saying. He says, We are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Right? We're not under obligation to do what's wrong. Why? We're not the devil's slaves anymore. We're not sin's slaves anymore. We're not under obligation. Now we're obedient to Christ. Now we're followers of Jesus. Now we're doing what God wants us to do in our lives. Amen. For all who are being <coughs> led. Amen. For you are not under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body. As a Christian, you're in warfare and you have the responsibility to put to death the deeds of the body. What does that mean? That if sin tries to rise up and you're tempted, if some evil desire comes up, some compulsion, something you've given yourself to in your past life before you came to Christ, and it rises up and it wants you to say, come on in, let's have some more fun together. Instead of that, what do you do? You put to death the deeds of the body. You say, no, no. Get out of here, you devil. Get out of here, evil. Get out of here, lust. Get out of here, bondage. Get out of here, wickedness. Get out of here, evil of the past. You have nothing to do with me. I am a child of the living God. I have been set free to be free and to do that which pleases and honors the Lord in my life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Hallelujah. I want you to know the sons of God have power with God and power in God and are anointed of God and blessed of God. If you're a son or a daughter of God, I want you to know heaven's working in your life. Now, what does he say? Very, very important. Next verse. For you have not received the spirit of slavery. Get that word? Leading to fear again. God didn't give you a spirit of slavery and bondage, going back and being dominated by evil. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons who cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. You have a new relationship, a deep relationship with God where you can cry out to God and He looks at you as His son or His daughter and He pours out on you the mercy and the grace and the blessings that He's provided in Christ to sustain you, to strengthen you, to keep you, to build you, to edify you, to lift you up and not push you down. Somebody say amen. amen. He's working in your heart and your life to set you free and to make you free indeed. Amen. For you have not received the spirit of slavery. Verse 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Hallelujah. Say, I'm a child of God. You receive Christ, you have the right to say that boldly and authoritatively. I am a child of God. To as many as received Jesus, He gave the right or the power to become the children of God. And you have the right, you have the authority to say, I am a child of God. What does he say next? And if we're children, then we're heirs. And also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So if we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified with Him. Let, let me very quickly point out some things and I'm going to close very shortly. So you hold on here. Amen. There we go. First of all, if you've received Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, you have the freedom to love and obey God. Amen. You have the freedom Amen. to love and obey God because the power and the bondage of past sins has been broken and that thing does not have to control you. You say, but pastor, I fight a continual battle with some of those things. That's all right. Keep fighting. Keep kicking the devil down. And every time you struggle, uh, rise up and fight some more. Don't give in. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep fighting against it. Second, you have a freedom to love and serve one another. You have a freedom to love and serve 
one another and to minister to the needs of your fellow Christians and to those in the world who need help. Now let me point out two great commandments. You know what they are. You can probably quote them as well as I can. Matthew, the first and the greatest commandment of these is what? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Now, I'm free to do what? I'm free to fulfill the law of righteousness, right? Yeah. Jesus said if you want to know what the whole law is summed up into, it's these two things. First of all, He said you will love God with all your heart, soul, your mind, and your strength. Amen. The second thing is what? He said you will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. In other words, if you want to sum up, bring it all right down to the, the meaning and the impact of it all. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself, is a, it means that you will have fulfilled the, the whole complete law of God. In doing those two things. There's a lot involved in those commandments, right? But Jesus said there are the two greatest commandments. Now, there are two different paths with two different results. There's the path of the flesh, which is the path of disobedience. There's the path of the spirit, which is the path of obedience to God. In the book of Galatians, Paul says, But I say, walk by the spirit. And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these two are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But, if you are, what? Led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, meaning the law of sin and death. You are not under the power and the dominion of those things. The Holy Spirit is in you. And if you listen to the Spirit and follow the Spirit, you're not dominated by those things. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now what's going to happen to the people who do those things? They're going to die. The wages of sin is what? Death. 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 We preached about it, already quoted the verse, right? And that's what Paul is, is referring to. But on the other hand, what does the Apostle Paul say? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In other words, if the Holy Spirit's in you and living in your life to be a different person, to live a Christian life, He says, then let's walk it. Let's not just talk it. We've got too many talkers uh, in the world already. Let's not just talk about being a right kind of person. Let's be a right kind of person. Let's let the Spirit tell us what is right and let's be obedient and follow the Holy Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So we have a true freedom. We have a true freedom. Do you believe you have a true freedom? Yes. Amen. It, are you free in the Lord? We have a freedom where we can live to please God through obedience to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That is your freedom. You can please God through obedience to Christ and the Holy Spirit. You have a freedom to be free from the dominion of evil and sin in your life and you now can practice what pleases God. But you also have a freedom to love and serve others as Christ did in living and dying for others. So that you will fulfill not only the first commandment of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but you will also be a person who loves Christ and fulfills the loving of your neighbor even as you love yourself. 
Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We have been set free to be free. Are you living in your freedom? Are you living in the freedom of Christ? Or do you have to say that sin is... I've allowed it to dominate my life. I've allowed it to come back in and affect me and control my thoughts and influence me to do wrong. If you have, thank God there is a pathway to repentance and forgiveness with Christ. Amen? Amen. He's long-suffering with us. He's long-suffering. He knows we're people who struggle and stumble at times. But the love of God that died for you while you were yet a sinner is a love that keeps working in you and with you. Remember, he which has begun a good work will perform it until when? Until you get tired? Until he gets tired? No. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Until it's all wound up. He's going to keep working in you knowing your challenges and struggles. And he wanted you to Learn to assert your freedom and your liberty and your victory. Amen. Have you ever met a person who went around and all day long it was, oh, life is so bad. Life is so tough. I get up and I can hardly get out of bed and I go through my day and miserable and I ache and I'm I just, this is terrible, terrible. You're, you're a by like it. You get around them and it's like a big wet blanket. They just wrap you up in it. By the time you get away from them, you get away saying, Phew. right? Because it saps your life and your energy. That is the opposite of what God wants in you. God wants you to assert by faith, I am a child of God. My sins have been forgiven. I have the Holy Spirit who is transforming me in Jesus' name. I have been set free to live in righteousness and to do what pleases God. Amen? Amen. Rather than confess misery, doubt, and failure, and weakness, and my proneness to do everything wrong, I assert that in Christ I have been given a new grant on life and a new grant on eternity and the blessings of the Lord. Would you say amen? Amen. amen. So I, I say to you, brothers and sisters, affirm what Christ has done in you and what He is doing in you. Say, Pastor, don't feel victorious after I fail. That's all right. Get up. Get going again. Start confessing who you are in Christ and what God is doing in you. And it won't be long till the feelings come back. You can see feelings follow action. Feelings follow action. And when you take actions based on your faith, the feelings of victory and triumph and, and God's grace begin to flow into your life. So feelings, you know, have you ever heard the saying, fact, faith, and feeling? When, for a walk on a wall, Feeling fell down and pulled faith with him. But the fact remained and he pulled up faith and feeling with him. And do you get the impact of that? Is that feelings are fickle and they can drop on a moment on a dime. And they can fall all the way down. And they can pull down your faith. But you know there's a fact. You've received Jesus Christ. Isn't that a fact? Yeah. You've invited Christ into your heart and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Isn't that a fact? Yeah. I am a child of God. The Holy Spirit lives in me. That's a fact. God has forgiven my sins. He's taken me to it. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of God. That's a fact. Hallelujah. And, and, and that fact of the truth in Scripture pulls back up your sense of, of faith and your faith returns and then the feelings come back too. 
You see, we all fight those battles where feelings want to tumble us off the wall and make us feel like the facts aren't there, but the facts are like rock solid. Hallelujah. The facts are there. Jesus lived and died and was uh, raised from the dead and, and ascended to the Father's right hand, and there He makes intercession for us. That's the fact. And so we can live on the basis of that fact. Hallelujah. Amen. And know that we can be victors and we confess the facts. Amen. Amen. And that makes it clear in our own minds that I can love and please God and I can love my neighbor as I ought to and do what God wills for me to do. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I pray that you take your word today and God burn it in some sense into our spirit and our mind so that we have this sense of, uh, of victory. We have this sense of being able to triumph even in the midst of difficult circumstances, that we have the sense that we can rise up and be victorious even when the enemy is at the door beckoning us to do what's wrong and evil, that we can say because of your spirit in us and because we've been raised to live a new life, we can say, get thee behind me, Satan, and we can walk a new life and live a new life, Lord. Oh, God. Help us to realize we've been set free so that we can really be free to present ourselves to God and to do the will of God. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I just pray for every, every yoke, every bondage, every sin, every lie, every false idea that the enemy has presented. Lord, trying to discourage us and to pull us down and to keep us down. I pray that it'll be broken, Lord. Broken, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 So while our heads are bowed, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. How many of you would say, Pastor Ford, God's spoken to my heart? And I realize I need to respond to God and ask God to help me today to assert my faith and to assert my victory. Thank you and to assert my new life and my new walk with the Lord. Amen. So the enemy will not dominate me or control me in my life. Anyone else want to raise their hands and pass the prayer for me? Amen. Hallelujah. Sing me that chorus, Jesus breaks every fetter. Jesus breaks every fetter. time and as I sing it I want you to think about your fetter. I want you to think about that thing that the enemy's told you you can't quit, you can't stop, it'll be in your life forever. I want you to think about that sin, that habit, that power that the enemy is saying you have to have this or you just can't survive without it. I want you to think about that as you sing this song and I want you in faith to sing it in regard to that. Jesus prays every fetter Jesus breaks every fetter. Jesus breaks every fetter. And He sets me free. I will shout hallelujah. I will shout. Amen. If there's any one of you who wants us to pray for you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord for healing, or to join together with you in prayer for any issue in your life, I want you to just to stand and come forward today. We want to pray and believe God with you. Anyone who desires prayer, praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We believe that God's a miracle working God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. All right.
Would you stand with me today? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. God, your word is a sure word, and it is a true word. Let it, O oh God, build a fire in our spirit, a fire that the enemy cannot quench. Hallelujah. Let it be a hammer to break the rocks into pieces. O oh God, let it be a wind to blow away all that rubbish and trash the enemy would try to put in our lives. Let your word of God, O oh God, be a light to open up our eyes in the darkness to see the truth of God and the victory that is ours. O oh God, we pray it in Jesus' name. I pray your mercy and your blessing on every person here today. People who are struggling, people who are facing challenges, Lord. People who are seeking breakthrough. Lord, let the anointing and the outpouring of your spirit come. God, to minister your grace and help in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to be setting up tables and arranging things in preparation for our meal. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to eat. Uh, cooking some hamburgers and hot dogs. That's and getting them ready. Right. So. <laughs>